welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to take an early look at the highly anticipated Dying Light 2 and see what exactly it does differently both technically and from a gameplay perspective to the original 2016 title Dying Light. For those of you unfamiliar with this series, Dying Light is a first-person, narrative-driven action-adventure game where players complete missions, collect loot, and fight hordes of unique zombies using a wide range of weapons and parkour abilities, the latter of which helps to greatly set it apart from other, more conventional zombie bashing adventures. Assisting it further is the brilliant day-night cycle that transforms the relatively tame gameplay experience during the daytime into a heart-pounding nightmare once the sun sets. Fast forward to today, and now we have the long-awaited sequel, Dying Light 2, that promises to build upon its largely popular formula with a brand new narrative, expanded parkour systems, and even more deadly late-night strolls. There's a ton to get through here, so let's break things down by first taking a look at the presentation. For reference, both games are being played on a PC, with the graphics set to their highest settings at a native 4K resolution. However, options like motion blur, chromatic aberration, and film grain will be disabled in order to provide cleaner image captures. Also, please bear in mind that the version that I was able to play of Dying Light 2 is an early review build, so any bugs or issues that I may point out could potentially be addressed by release via a day one patch. Alright, so let's kick things off by first looking at some character models. Now, as this is a first-person game, the main character models themselves are not tactically visible, at least not when playing in single-player mode. But the various miscellaneous characters on the other hand have seen a big boost to their fidelity in the sequel, with vastly superior facial geometry, more complex animations, and better interaction with various environmental light sources. You can also make out more fine details with each character, like individual hairs in their beards or the fine stitching in each of the outfits being worn. It's not necessarily revolutionary, as the models still have a sort of stylized look to them, but it's a big step forward from the original game nonetheless. The various zombies have also been improved in this regard. There's more variety in the default biter enemy types, for example, so you won't see as many clones walking side by side like you did before. However, the one thing that I feel might be a step back here are the animations. The zombies move just fine on their own, but I found that the great ragdoll effects from Dying Light 1 don't seem to be functioning as consistently in the sequel. Kicking a zombie off a roof, for example, doesn't cause them to tumble off the roof like before, but instead, they seem to fall off like a Looney Tunes character, pausing in the air for a second before their ragdoll effect kicks in and then drops them straight down. Kicking zombies into these spiked barriers demonstrates a similar issue, where the zombies no longer seem to get stuck on the spikes, but instead fall straight down on the ground after touching the spikes, as if someone flipped a 1 to a 0. According to Techland, this is something that will likely be patched with later quality of life improvements, but we'll just have to wait and see if this issue persists in the final release build. Next up, we have the level environments. Dying Light 2's environment is a major changeup from what players experienced in Dying Light 1. In Dying Light 1, players explored a fictional interpretation of the Turkish city-state Haran, which had just been exposed to a deadly zombie plague and was then subsequently sealed off from the rest of the world to help contain it. This game world is composed of two major locations, separated by loading screens. The starting area is the slums, a large favela-style location located along the shore, with lots of variable elevation and small, interconnected residential areas. Once the player has progressed far enough, they can then travel to the more established Old Town District, which is a far more dense city area, with lots of tall structures and gridlocked city streets. Both locations offer a vast playground that takes full advantage of the game's unique parkour mechanics, with things like narrow, tightrope cables stretch over buildings, ramps, obstacles to slide and vault over, and several clearly marked blue objects like piles of trash that players can jump onto for a quick descent from a high building. Along with this is the game's expansion location, the countryside, that offers a wide open, flat valley to explore built to take advantage of a new vehicle mechanic. Dying Light 2, on the other hand, takes place in an entirely fictional location called Villador. Villador appears to be some sort of post-apocalyptic take on an unknown European city, where the few remaining survivors have rebuilt society on the rooftops, 
while the zombie threat continues to loom down on the streets. The result of this presents a highly unusual looking play area, where rooftop gardens stretch across the skyline, broken up by dark, lifeless trenches below. Like with the first dying light, Villador is a runner's paradise, with a wide range of different structures and obstacles set up to allow players to easily transition from rooftop to rooftop without ever needing to touch the ground. The game retains some of the same visual concepts from before, like yellow markers to indicate when an object can be climbed on, or blue markers to indicate safe places to drop to. But there's a lot more fun obstacles to jump on and off of that weren't in the first game. Players can now swing from monkey bars, long ropes, and will even need to counterbalance long beams to help reach high platforms. It's a more dynamic sandbox this time around, and the addition of rooftop gardens adds a really unique style to it all. As far as the quality goes, Dying Light 2 also sees a big uptick to the amount of detail, on and above its many city streets. Texture maps have been upgraded across the board, with 4K textures being used for things like building surfaces and the ground. Additionally, the great flowing tall grass sprite effect previously introduced in Dying Light 1's following DLC has returned, and can be seen along many rooftops, and even serve a critical role as a new hiding place for players. Then there's the downtown area, the second major area in the game, accessible after progressing further in the story, and without the need for any apparent loading screens either. The downtown area is gigantic, with much taller buildings on average than anything we saw in Dying Light 1. It's also a much more dense location, with lots of these post-apocalyptic looking structures lining the various overgrown rooftops that helps to give it a very unusual look. There's a few other unique areas in the game as well, but for the sake of avoiding spoiling too much, I think it's easier to say that Dying Light 2 offers not just a larger, more detailed world to explore, but a much more unique and creative world as well. To help bring this world to life, we have Dying Light 2's reworked lighting design. Now, this is an area where I'm a bit conflicted. One of the aspects that I feel the first Dying Light really nailed was the general color grading of its game world. While the lighting techniques at play weren't necessarily the best out there, the world still felt incredibly natural and realistic, with lighting that felt genuinely dark and terrifying once the sun set. Dying Light 2, however, has a slightly less realistic tone to it. The lighting is brighter and more vibrant, accentuating the gorgeous rooftop gardens by really bringing out all the green and yellow. But at the same time, it seems to take away a bit from the original's more horror-oriented tone. I think the best example of this is when the sun sets across the environment. In Dying Light 1, the game world gets extremely dark, so dark that turning off the flashlight will make it literally impossible to see what's directly in front of the player. The moonlight does eventually come out and illuminate more of the environment to help navigate, but even then, churning a corner into an alley without a light is pretty much a death sentence. Dying Light 2 does still provide this level of darkness to some extent. However, Villador has this sort of blue, violet glow when the sun sets that keeps the world from reaching that pitch black level of the original game. Once you're on the actual streets below, it's a different story. A flashlight is once again required to navigate efficiently, and turning the wrong corner or venturing inside without it is ill-advised. Even still, Dying Light 2 on average has a much brighter tone to it that appears to be more of a stylistic choice than anything else. This is even more apparent when considering the much more advanced lighting techniques at play here. With the help of NVIDIA's RTX technology, Dying Light 2 features some really impressive lighting effects, including more advanced global illumination, allowing for realistic bounce lighting in the environment. Especially in interior spaces like this one, a separate ray-traced flashlight effect that similarly improves the way the player's own light causes light to bounce on nearby objects, and ray-traced reflections, which can be easily observed when looking at the wet rooftops following a rainstorm, or the many window panes on buildings. On top of this, Dying Light 2 also incorporates ray-traced ambient occlusion techniques for superior object shading and self-shadowing, along with ray-traced sun shadows, which is a huge upgrade over the original game's hit-or-miss implementation of the old PCSS technology which, on occasion, provided some very realistic soft shadows for things like tree leaves, 
but other times turn shadows into a jostled pixelated mess along surfaces. This new ray trace solution, however, handles this much more effectively, and shadows cast by trees and structures appear more realistically relative to the distance to the light source, in this case, the sun. It doesn't seem to affect the player's shadow, unfortunately, suggesting that the player's shadow is more static and automatically shifts depending on the time of day. Though, it is worth noting that Dying Light 1 never even cast a player's shadow before, so this is still an improvement. Additionally, I found that for whatever reason, the flashlight in Dying Light 2 doesn't seem to cast any shadows for both objects or character models. I've tested this with the ray traced effects on and off, and have yet to see any shadows properly cast by zombies, so we're just gonna have to wait and see if this gets addressed at some point. Then we have effects. The Dying Light games sport a lot of effects, chief among them being the fantastic gore system that, because of YouTube's ad-friendly guidelines, I'll have to gloss over here. But rest assured, those same great gore effects have been retained with the sequel, and expanded slightly with an increase to particle effects and general consistency relative to the weapon that the player uses. In fact, particle effects are probably the area with the most additions here. There's a ton of particles incorporated into everything, from new zombie types to environmental decor, like flies buzzing around piles of bodies in the street, or other colored particles from unique plants and player buffs. This seems to go hand in hand with the game's new stylistic approach to the art design, with more color being incorporated to give the game an almost fantastical feel. Other effects like water simulation, fire, and explosions haven't really been overhauled all too much. There's still some subtle changes like reworked particles and alpha effects, but it's otherwise being handled the same way as before. Now let's switch gears here and talk about some of the biggest changes that I've come across in terms of the gameplay design starting with the new renewed focus on the game's RPG systems. The game's story, for example, now allows players to choose dialogue options, many of which have actual long-standing impacts on the player's save, including faction presence in certain areas, and additional environmental tweaks to improve or hinder traversal. Players can also make specific player builds based on their preferred playstyle, by equipping different types of gear with variable buffs and counters. This replaces the old system where clothing was purely cosmetic, and goes hand in hand with the design of RPG systems being used in other popular games at the moment. These RPG elements also extend to the enemies that you'll face in the world. Zombies by default now have visible health bars above their heads, along with a recommended level for engagement. Now, to be clear, the original Dying Light was technically still an action RPG as well, so while health bars didn't necessarily appear above enemies' heads, they did still have distinctive levels and health that would require players to use more powerful weapons in order to defeat them. For those players that want a more traditional Dying Light experience, the game's options do allow for health bars to be hidden. But it's worth noting that the recommended level of these zombies do still play a bigger role than before. Stealth takedowns, for example, can only be successfully performed on zombies if the player has a high enough player level. Otherwise, the zombie can break away from the grab and cause nearby enemies to be alerted. Another big change is the introduction of a new infection system. Unlike the first game, where players could essentially sneak around during the nighttime as carefully as possible, Dying Light 2 pushes players to constantly stay on the move by introducing a new artificial timer. This timer will continuously drain so long as the player is standing in darkness and must be recharged by standing in UV light. Whether that be one of the many UV light stations set up at night, or the sun itself. Players can alternatively use found or crafted medicine to replenish the clock partially. But even still, the game does its best to encourage players to actually move around at night, rather than hiding in a corner waiting for the sun to rise. Along with this, Dying Light 2 also introduces a new zombie type called the Howler, that serves as a slightly more forgiving version of the deadly volatiles from the first game. The Howlers typically patrol the streets in between crowds of standard biters, and if alerted, will trigger a chase event, where fast-moving infected will crawl out of nearby sewer mains and windows and pursue the player. Players can always escape to a UV light station to end the chase, or can try and duck into a hiding place like clearly marked tall grass on the rooftops. The Volatiles do return in the sequel, but they're not nearly as prevalent as they were before, 
and typically only show up during higher chase event tiers, or in more challenging areas of the map. During the daytime, the streets also are much more empty than they were before. There's still plenty of zombies on the street to beat up, but most of the biters now reside inside dark structures, where they sleep in the most uncomfortable positions imaginable. This is a lot like the volatile hives introduced before, but now are a constant presence across most of the game world, and provide players with a constant source of valuable loot at the expense of a high risk. Special infected types also return in Dying Light too, including returning favorites like the Bolter and the Heavy Goons. But there's also a few new enemy types like this Banshee, that can parkour off of zombie heads and dash towards the player with her razor sharp nails. For players looking for even more challenge, Dying Light 2's open world now offers distinctive boss areas, where players can face off against an even more powerful monster to earn valuable loot necessary for leveling up. Which brings us to the next big change, the skill tree. In Dying Light 1, the skill tree is broken up into three initial categories, Survivor, Agility, and Power. By completing actions related to any of these three categories, players can earn skill points, which can then be used to unlock new player abilities to enhance that part of the gameplay further. Agility skills, for example, unlocked new parkour moves, making maneuverability more manageable, while power skills improve the player's combat capabilities. The survivor tree, on the other hand, was a sort of catch-all for players that liked to loot and sneak around and offered special abilities like being able to camouflage using a defeated enemy and then walk through a crowd of zombies unseen. Dying Light 2, however, scraps this third category, along with some of the skills presented in it. From what I've played so far, there's no way to camouflage in Dying Light 2, likely due to the inclusion of the new hiding places mechanic. And the old weapon throw option also seems to be absent, meaning you won't be able to toss your weapon at an enemy and pick it up like you could before. But most other abilities do make a return, and have even been expanded further. There's also a few new tools, like a paraglider, that can be used to fly across the concrete jungles effortlessly. The parkour systems have also been expanded upon, allowing players to combine previous slides, tic tacs, and vaults with a handy wall run, monkey bar swing, and a suite of combat moves that help to expand on the increased emphasis on melee combat, like a targeted dropkick, and several slow motion triggers pending a successful dodge or parry. Which brings us to our next point, the combat. Like with Dying Light 1, the focus here is on melee combat. There are some ranged weapons like bows and makeshift firearms, but primarily you'll be forced to use various blades and blunt objects for combat. With this focus on melee combat, players can parry and more effectively dodge. Unlike the first game, where melee combat with other humans using melee weapons was often a bit unpredictable. There's a ton of other changes included as well, like new open world activities, new binoculars to spot points of interest, and the rare and well defended inhibitors required to increase the player's max stamina and health. But let's move on now to a brief sound comparison. Which game do you feel has the superior audio quality and design?
And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, Dying Light 2 offers a substantial overhaul to the Dying Light formula. The game retains its core DNA, with players needing to traverse rooftops using a suite of cool parkour moves, beat up some zombies, and do it all before the sun sets. But there seems to be a lot more refinement to these mechanics, in order to better incorporate a heavier RPG focus. Visually, the game makes several technical innovations, though it also does so at the expense of the original game's more realistic art direction, providing a drastically different new style to the series. It's not necessarily worse, as I feel it's purely subjective at this point, and its use of ray tracing certainly enhances the scene to a level that wasn't possible before. But the stylistic shift is fairly apparent. So what do you guys think? Are you excited for Dying Light 2? Or is there something about Dying Light 1 that you prefer instead? Let me know in the comments section, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this posted every week.